Hello, everyone, and welcome to my virtual presentation, Colonial Lingualism, Colonial Legacies, Imperial Mindsets, and Inequitable Practices in English Language Teaching. So an overview for today's talk. Um, I will first position myself as a learner researcher. Um, I'll then discuss a little bit about the transformative limits of translanguaging and plurilingualism. I'll then move on to extractive epistemological foundations, colonial English, and the formation of imperial mindsets. Um, and then look at the impacts of colonial lingualism, once I have established what it is, on learner heritages, identities, and the environment. I'll then discuss how we could address colonial lingualism, and I propose uh, trans-epistemic language education and heritage language pedagogy. Um, I will then give an example of trans-epistemic language education and heritage language pedagogy in practice with the World Viewer and the Technology Research Project that I'm currently undertaking. I'll then wrap up today's presentation with some concluding remarks. So, who am I? It's Misha Paul Miechen Shiblo, Shegel Ahanum, Rugg as Hokemi, Aunan Glasahu, Aunan Alapa, Shenir Ranthi, Ahanum, Aunan McGill University, Montreal, Agus Isma Ur Khan Yuhu. I introduce myself in my language, uh, Scottish Gaelic or Gaelic. Um, I'll now say that in English, my name is Paul Megan Chiblow. I am a Scottish Gael. I was born and raised in Glasgow, Scotland, and I am a PhD candidate in educational studies at McGill University, Montreal. And it's very nice to be talking with you all today, virtually. Where am I? I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land on which I'm delivering this virtual presentation. I would like to acknowledge this land, the plants, water, animals, and spirits. For thousands of years, Kitkoronto has been the traditional land and territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I'd like to say that I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to work and to live on this land and to be talking with you all virtually today. Um, so some reasons for my research. Um, the research basically comes from my, first of all, from my own personal experiences as a Scottish Gael growing up in Glasgow, Scotland in the educational system. Uh, my language, Gaelic, Scottish Gaelic, was not a course option or elective. It wasn't available, in other words, to me in the educational system, even if I wanted to learn it. Um, however, languages such as English, French, Spanish were all available, I am, and I'm now fluent in those languages. Um, and growing up as well, I've learned stories of how, um, for example, family members recall being beaten for speaking Gaelic in schools um, and corrected to speak only in English. Um, and also a historical aspect of it as well, the Scottish Gaels being cleared off of their land for um, aristotic, uh, aristocratic farming practices, for example. Um, my knowledge um, of all of this, the impacts of colonization on languages has grown since meeting and marrying my Anishinaabe Ojibwe husband in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, I have since learned of the devastating impacts of colonization on the indigenous peoples and languages of Turtle Island, or what is also known as North America. Uh, these experiences have driven me to enact more equitable education and language policy. And my research therefore focuses on indigenous language revitalization and decolonizing language education to make it more equitable. Um, and I also focus on decolonizing more broadly um, applied linguistics, social linguistics, and looking at eco-linguistics as well. 
So that's a little bit about me positioning myself as a learner researcher in relation to the work that I'm doing. I'm now going to move on to discuss the transformative limits um, as I see it and as Jasper sees it in the 2017 article of translanguaging and plurilingualism. So it's been incredibly important, the, the multilingual turn in second language acquisition and also the proliferation of translanguaging and plurilingual approaches in English language education and language education more broadly. However, um, the languages or languaging processes implemented in translanguaging or plurilingual classrooms still tend to reflect the experiences and belief systems of dominant nation state, quote unquote, official and or colonial languages. Uh, for example, English, French and Spanish, like I, I listed before, as opposed to those of oppressed, minoritized and or indigenous languages. So this focus on dominant nation state or colonial languages in the English classroom um, is problematic, harmful, and perpetuates epistemic injustices. Colonial languages such as English and by extension languaging processes and the repertoires they may entail carry colonial legacies and can uphold an, an imperial and neoliberal worldview. Um, to my mind, the Euro North American worldview is characterized by uh, first linguistic imperialism and cognitive imperialism. The view that humans are superior to nature or coined here as human exceptionalism by Haraway in 2008. And thirdly, by a white epistemological supremacy. So for example here, um, viewing land um, as an extractive resource um, as opposed to a relative. And the commodification and disembodiment of language from the environment for economic profit to meet the agenda of capitalist political elites. So this imperialistic and neoliberal worldview can also ignore, in addition to the impacts on the land and the commodification and disembodiment, you can also ignore the imbalance in status and power between majority and minority languages. It can promote monolingual ways of seeing multilingualism. It can uphold inequalities of multilingualism and also destroy language oppressed people's epistemolo epistemologies. And I'll be unpacking all of these um, aspects and concepts more throughout the presentation as well and give some more examples of what I mean by colonial lingualism when we get to that point. So here I contend that the privileging of dominant colonial knowledges and languages and uh, using uh, Kubota's term here, neoliberal valor valorizations of diversity in English language education and language education generally is an enactment of colonial lingualism. I define colonial lingualism as a process through which a colonial and imperial worldview such as thinking, reasoning, logic, belief, value systems, and actions and behaviors is transmitted through language. Colonialism is, colonial lingualism, excuse me, is subtractive and detrimental to multilingual, multicultural learners' identities and heritages, endangered indigenous languages and knowledges, minoritized communities, and our environment. Endangered indigenous languages, for example, are inseparable from culture and the land. And these worldviews and ecocentric Earth-centered Earth worldviews continue to face epistemic and linguistic threats with the advance of neoliberalism and colonization and globalization more broadly. I argue that First, colonial lingualism illustrates the transformative limits here mentioned by Jasper in 2018 of translanguaging and plurilingualism. And that an epistemic unlearning of the Western epistemological error, epistemological error, I'll touch on this um, uh, further on into the presentation, is a term coined by Bateson and Gregory Bateson in 1972. I, I argue that this 
unlearning of the epistemological error is required to enable equitable validation of all languages, knowledge systems, and languaging processes, including those indigenous and minoritized in translanguaging and plurilingual classrooms. So in this presentation, trans epistemic language education, uh, which I first introduced in the Belonging Identity Language and Diversity Research Group uh, blog post, in the context of Turtle Island, will be given to illustrate how an epistemic unlearning and a trans systemic knowledge exchange while languaging can take place. I do this in the spirit that once colonial lingual practices and origins are identified, language educators across the globe can be even better placed for future dialogue and collaboration, for more equitable relational multilingualism and transformative teaching practices. So here I'm going to unpack um, a little bit more the theoretical underpinnings um, of colonial English and extractive epistemological foundations. So the belief system or worldview for which we language is fundamental. The English language is a dominant Western language with a colonial and assimilationist legacy. And the belief system or worldview that colonial English represents has grown from the monolingual, epistemic, and linguistically quote unquote superior ideology first imposed for an internal colonialism on the Celtic nations and languages of the British Isles, such as Scottish Gaelic, to include a present day global neoliberal ideology based on economic growth, products, and capitalism. Some may argue that colonial English for example, is a natural, useful commodity or a quote unquote passport to success um, for work, for education, um, and can lead to the top of a linguistic or social linguistic hierarchy. However, this hierarchy is not unsurprisingly equitable. It's founded on linguistic and cognitive imperialism and social linguistic and cultural essentialism. So the commodification, like I touched on previously, and disembodiment of language from, or of English in this case, from the environment for economic profit and power for capitalism or linguistic imperialism is an example um, of linguistic entrepreneurship, citing da Costa here, where language can be leveraged as a resource, as capital um, in a quote unquote modern global neoliberal empire. However, colonial English is not neutral or a neutral commodity. It has been imposed on non-dominant cultures and quote unquote vernacular or quote unquote inferior languages under the tenets of quote unquote civilization and or supposed cultural and linguistic superiority. This linguistic and cognitive imperialism has led to the linguistic and ethnic genocide of the peoples colonized by the British Empire, such as the, the, an example here, the residential schools in Canada. Colonial and assimilationist legacies and mindsets reside in the human exceptionalism, uh, the view that humans are uh, above the rest of nature, that land is a resource to be exploited and manipulated by humans, um, and this could be viewed as the quote unquote epistemological error that I touched on before, which characterizes dominant Western thought. It permeates our institutions, our day to day lives. This also leads, for example, to the positivist quote unquote objective view as a Western human as quote unquote superior to the rest of nature or quote unquote the other. And this has led to social and environmental injustices, epistemicide, a naive empiricism and a quote unquote arrogant elitism in research and in teaching. So um, as I said before, this epistemological error dominates the current mainstream Western and human-centered worldview, our institutions, our mindsets, our classrooms, and by extension, the English language. And this goes for other colonial languages and colonial uh, language settings also. Um, here an example, as President Roosevelt stated now a century ago, we have room for but one language here, and talking about the United States, and that is the English language. 
So this assumed colonial cultural and linguistic superiority set the foundations for a cognitive imperialism or a white epistemological supremacy. And the goal of that is to quote, eradicate all vestiges of the subjugated and conquered cultures and their respective languages. So linguistic imperialism privileges those who use the dominant quote unquote standard nation state form of English. This is a form of linguicism, a, or a quote uh, from Philip Simmons Scutnam Kangas of one language over others in ways that parallel societal structuring through racism, sexism, and class, and privileges users of the standard forms of the dominant language, which represents, therefore, convertible linguistic capital, touching back on the commodification element of language that I mentioned before. This linguistic imperialism normalizes a racial linguistic hierarchy and a quote unquote deficit ideology, positioning English at the top as a useful commodity or as a passport to success, as I mentioned before, and for prestige for speakers of alternative non-dominant languages. Learning English, therefore, is often actively promoted, normalized, and internalized by learners and parents alike as the language to speak, the language of quote-unquote progress and civility at the expense of alternative languages. So these neoliberal monolingual ideologies can further minoritize speakers of alternative languages and essentialize them as subjects groomed for work with quote unquote basic, quote unquote functional or a critical, a historical transactional English language skills. Um, and despite what is typically touted as the selling point for learning a majority or a colonial language, neoliberal colonial English does not always lead to transformative social change for those who acquire English as a second or a foreign language due to epistemological racisms and the privileging of Western, white, Euro, North American knowledge systems. So there is a lack of historical balance and consideration of social, cultural and political contexts, such as what I've been speaking about in this presentation, the impacts and effects of colonization, imperialism, neoliberalism, globalization in applied linguistics and in English language education. Some examples here of colonial and imperial ideologies and pedagogies. They include, but are not limited to, privileging Western print canon uh, written form and quote unquote standard forms of language as opposed to land or place-based education or community quote unquote vernacular language forms and also visual oral semiotic literacies and repertoires. Second, English only monolingual learning environments to the detriment, I should say subtractive English only monolingual learning environments to the detriment of multicultural and multilingual backgrounds. Three, decontextualized disembodied languages, resource languages, code tasks, for example, rote drilling, grammar, comprehension exercises without any deeper analysis of meaning or historical context or social context four extractive Western research paradigms and methods, and five physical or mental punishment and violence for speaking a heritage and or indigenous language. So colonial lingualism transmits detrimental and inequitable colonial and imperialistic mindsets, knowledge and belief systems through the teaching and learning of languages, in this case, English. And the focus on neoliberal and colonial ideologies worldwide and the commodification of language as a resource, as a code, as um, a, a product, something that can be leveraged, um, also means we become increasingly disconnected from our environment and from nature. The way we language and the worldview we enact can have direct repercussions in how we treat us or those around us and the land. So I touched on this before that I would say, I said I would give some more examples here. So for example, labeling or categorizing respect to traditional territories as quote unquote wasteland or animals as quote unquote wildlife in English may mean we become more complicit in their mistreatment and disregard the surroundings around us. So just uh, to quantify this and to avoid essentialism, the English language in itself is not the problem. The speakers, the worldviews, the how we behave based off of our value systems and our frames of reference. So 
the colonial and neoliberal ideologies influence how we language, the, i.e. the categorizations we use, what we therefore value, and how we relate to each other, the environment, and the more than human. So with the multilingual turn in second language education, as I said before, there have been very plaudible and good movements towards more culturally responsive curricula in the English learning classroom, for example, translanguaging and plurilingualism. However, um, as I exemplified before with the transformative limits as such, currently, the languages acknowledged and are implemented still tend to be colonial, quote unquote, official nation state and or non endangered languages. So in colonial lingual English language education settings, what is therefore transmitted is a colonial mentality or a deficit ideology that, quoting uh, Prem, uh, Dr. Prem Fayek here, that justifies inequalities as the outcome of deficiencies, be that intellectual, economic, and political, of the marginalized groups, and completely disregards the fact that social inequalities, including language inequalities, are shaped by unequal social political structures and policies. So on a micro or let's say a classroom level, colonial lingualism means that learners are viewed through a deficit lens, a heritage language deficit lens, whiteness, and learners are marginalized by white listening subjects looking for quote unquote the standard, let's say quote unquote native speaker forms and experience ethnic ambivalence or evasion, linguistic discrimination and linguistic racism. Therefore in the English language a uh, learning classroom here, as Moriano puts it, the learner's mind is colonized through the acquisition of a foreign tongue. At a macro level, outside of the classroom, linguistic commodification and entrepreneurship, um, as I built the case for during this presentation, um, largely ignore the social, cultural, historical, and ecological grounding of language and the profound impact language has on positive identity formation and well being. As Nash remarks, language and ideas of self and environment are amalgamated in complex relationships. And the focus on neoliberal ideologies worldwide and the commodification and disembodiment of language disconnects us and disembodies us from our environment, from ourselves, from nature, and from our quote unquote vital linguistic repertoires. And just an example here on an even visible scale the climate and humanitarian crises. So just to wrap things up here in this section of my talk, a neoliberal understanding of multilingualism is not in of itself better than a monolingual mindset. It only reproduces the cultural superiority of essentialized linguistic icons while devaluing and erasing non-privileged cultural forms and identities. So now I'm going to move on to the next section of um, the presentation and my talk today is having established uh, the underpinnings, what colonial lingual is, what can we do about it? Um, so the inequitable and detrimental practices of colonial lingualism can be facilitated or perpetuated even unwittingly, even unknowingly in the English as a second language or foreign language classroom, for example, or academic purposes or English language education classroom generally. The classroom is a political microcosm that reflects the belief system of the society at large and the nation state, or in this case, colonial nation state. Linen and notes, they, i.e. schools, deeply ref reflect, de reflect deeply our Western worldview, which is an underlying cause for the sustainability crisis, as I brought up before. And the goal of main goal of education would be to give future generations tools for thinking and seeing the world differently, constructing their own worldviews and acting to create a sustainable future. So there's a need to address colonial lingualism and to unlearn cognitive and linguistic imperialism so that all multilingual and multicultural learners are respected and validated in the English classroom. I introduce and suggest trans epistemic language education as one way in which this unlearning could be put into practice in the classroom. Trans epistemic language education is, quote, a way of learning, teaching, knowing, and being, which respects, sorry, which enables respectful and non hierarchical knowledge co creation while we engage with languages, peoples, cultures, and lands. <laughs> 
and here um, a figure that I created, trans-epistemic language education encompassing the past, present, and future influences of our learners, um, emanating from a heritage language pedagogy, which I'll touch on in the following slides, knowledge co-creation between educators and learners, a decolonizing relational technology, uh, which can feed into sustainable futures. So as figure one illustrates, trans-epistemic language education encompasses a past, present and future and enables a heritage language pedagogy to respectfully relate to languages, peoples, cultures and lands, a non-hierarchical knowledge co-creation as we language and relate, a decolonizing and relational technology use and greater opportunities for future environmental and humanitarian sustainability. So here, um, heritage language pedagogy um, should be from a chapter that, that came out this year, uh, not 201-2021, um, is a quote, method through which all multicultural multilingual learners, not only speakers or learners of dominant non-endangered languages, can feel fully empowered and validated in alternative holistic earth-centered as opposed to human-centered learning process. Heritage language speakers um, and, uh, and the languages themselves have been and cultures have been disenfranchised, minoritized, and or even forcefully eradicated in the name of linguistic imperialism and white epistemological supremacy with the advance of dominant colonial languages such as English. Heritage language speakers represent a rich tapestry of ancestries and cultures, very distinct languages and experiences, and a multitude of traditions across the world which have survived colonial, quote, erase and replace educational policies. So a culturally vitalizing and respectful, non-hierarchical knowledge co-creation process is uh, enabled and facilitated by trans-epistemic language education, by including our learners' worldviews and heritage knowledge systems, and is actively encouraged as well. A decolonizing technology facilitates this knowledge co-creation process by some examples here, formal, informal, and self-directed forms of learner, uh, learning. So uh, for instance, learner creations, uh, video recordings, online blogs, online discussion forums, videos, um, community-led apps, websites, and social media. These, quote, transnational forms can, one, uh, assert non-dominant heritage and or indigenous voices, creations, and, quote, rights to speak across nation-state boundaries. And two, can acknowledge the central role of local communities and the surrounding land and environment. So this greater exchange of worldviews and knowledges can enable greater opportunities for a trans-epistemic dialogue between educators and learners themselves, and uh, hopefully uh, emanating outwards into their families and local communities um, on present and future sustainability issues um, based on existing learner knowledges that may have been overlooked, dis diminished, or actively excluded in mainstream Western English classrooms. So at this point, I'm going to give an example of trans-epistemic language education in practice um, by giving you the, um, the example of the world viewer. Um, before I do so though, I just want to note here as part of the trans-epistemic language education process, I keep an online critical self-reflection journal of my own thoughts while I research, teach and reflect on my daily interactions with humans, fellow beings, and also with more than humans to check how my thinking um, has developed over time and also to explore blind spots in my own thinking. Um, so I employ trans and, and trans epistemic language education in the physical face-to-face -face English classroom by exploring non-Western uh, beyond neoliberal texts, which may not be part of a quote-unquote standard curriculum. So uh, for example here, texts written by authors with a non-dominant alternative ecocentric worldview, such as indigenous authors and creators. <clears throat> 
uh, I created a five lesson mini unit where we, learners and I, analyzed the rhetorical, grammatical, lexical and cultural aspects of a text and produced an interactive video response and comment blog, which documented our communal language and knowledge learning journey. I named this multimodal online classroom blog and exchange of worldviews a world viewer. Um, and this is also mentioned in a chapter that has just been released where I go into this in more detail. However, here's an example of the, the unit and lesson flow uh, broken down into the, the text focus, as I mentioned before. Uh, just as an example, rhetorical would mean researching the background of the author and the publisher. And it, the reason for that, or the potential lines of exploration, what kind of bias is there? What, what were the reasons why the text was written? At the end of each lesson, we would have a world review reflection log where the students reflected on the lesson and how it shaped their experience. Um, all of this built up towards lesson five, which would be the world view reflection log, which learners did independently. Um, some, in this case, did a video response or some did uh, written, um, and it was all posted on our classroom blog. And here's an example of the reflection log that the learners uh, compiled or answered at the end of each lesson. And here is the lesson five, the world of your summary. So write or record how your experiences with the article, indigenous knowledge systems can solve the problems of climate change have or have not grown and evolved throughout the entire unit. I should have mentioned that was a text that was chosen for the, uh, the mini unit. And here are some of the questions here, um, where we were employing, for example, Google Docs and YouTube um, as well, and uploading them onto the class blog. So um, the world viewer enabled us to learn English for an alternative decolonial lens. For example, in videos, learners contrasted and compared the definition of water in the English dictionary as odorless or tasteless uh, with the understanding that water is life in indigenous worldviews and languages. We reflected on our families, heritage, languages and cultures and shared these insights. We shared traditional indigenous place names, what they meant, and compared sustainable agricultural practices in their heritage languages and cultures, and this shared ecological insights and know-how with each other about the land that we may not have known before. So this is part of the knowledge co-creation aspect, and also touching into the relational technology too. So for example, I, uh, uh, as an educator in this instance, shared that in Gaelic, in my language, there are words and place names that speak to the history and the Viking English in my home islands of used the Jace, South Eust, this is in Outer Hebrides um, in Scotland, uh, such as Clit Nakari, Rock of the Weir, a place to catch fish. Um, and Clit is derived from the old Norse word clitter, a rock or a cliff. We also discussed phrases and the framing of the environment in dominant colonial English discourse, such as degradation of the environment. We, put, we wondered, what, why is then the, the noun here um, in this case? Who is degrading the environment? Why is agent missing? What effect does this have on our meaning and our, our actions or, who, or, an, or an accountability? Why is the environment degrading? So more, so that was a world viewer, and now I'm going to look at um, another example um, that I, of putting trans epistemic language education into practice with uh, the technology research project that I'm currently undertaking as part of um, my PhD research. So, um, the the previous example was done in a let's say face-to-face -face environment. This, um, the, the project itself, um, has been carried out in an online environment during the COVID-19 pandemic. And technology here uh, stands for traditional ecological knowledge and technology. This research is still ongoing and seeks to explore the intersections between Anishinaabemwin or Ojibwe language immersion and revitalization, traditional ecological knowledge and technology, and the effects thereof on intergenerational language transmission. <clears throat> 
It's a community-led project and it's taken place through the affordances of technology. So um, focus groups, uh, discussions, um, the videos, them the creations themselves have all taken place using technology and being done remotely online. So there was leading to, as I'm saying before, this is a process and will lead to the co-creation of a series of videos in the language, um, some fully immersive and in community settings as a learning um, and knowledge transmission tool. So some preliminary findings um, from this project and the implications tying it into this talk today on colonial lingualism. The participants shared how important the land and community is uh, for Indigenous language revitalization and for, in, for Indigenous language Anishinaabemowin in this case. Uh, there is a strong relationship between language, land, community, culture, and identity. And the elder and Anishinaabeg Nation Language Commissioner, Barbara Nolan, and the participants expressed how technology can be beneficial if it is implemented in a culturally and environmentally responsive manner to address the harms of colonization. So furthermore, um, the project is stressing the benefits of language immersion. Uh, for example, uh, the elder uh, gave the example of French in Quebec and how successful language immersion was in that case in Quebec, where a group of parents stimulated uh, fully immersive French language education, and which has now grown um, and is more common throughout Quebec and has had considerable um, good results for, for the French language in this case. It also stressed the benefits of embodied storytelling, such as using props, visuals, gestures to transmit, get the message across using the words of the elder in the project here in the language and when, when it's fully immersive. So more examples of this for, can be found on barbaranolan.com. And here's an excerpt here from the website where you can find more information and more examples. So we, it also stresses of what, what I'm finding in the pre preliminary discussion and implications here are the benefits uh, of technology um, as an extension of a knowledge system and used relationally uh, for the benefit when it's led from the community, as opposed to being from an outside source which has no relationship or previous relationship. Um, stressing the value here um, of local community directed and led projects for capacity building. For example, something was suggested for having more jobs in the language, for, for example, in Anishinaabem and Ojibwe. We, we, we've also been taught, well, the findings here, what we've also been exploring is the stages here and the time involved in language education, the, the importance of allowing time to become an understander of the language, which is particularly important when we're speaking about Indigenous languages, which are have their own trauma-informed and trauma barriers to acquisition but based on colonization and the stages and the levels here, the hours it takes to go from understander, proficient to fluent. And we also discussed idea, we've also been discussing ideas for addressing colonial ideologies and language maintenance. For example, being asked, why are you learning the language? Um, and how we can incorporate land-based and community-based and led language education. So just to wrap up um, on today's talk, colonial lingualism, the transmission of colonial and neoliberal thinking, reasoning and mindsets and worldviews through language needs to be named, critiqued and addressed before we can say our classrooms are truly multilingual or value all linguistic repertoires and lifeways. And I've given the example here of the world viewer and also the technology research project here to illustrate what could be done in a way that encompasses not only um, dominant um, quote unquote na official or nation state languages only, but moving to include uh, language oppressed cultures um, and languages and indigenous languages and cultures. Um, the importance of teaching, acquiring and learning languages with their social, cultural, ecological and historical, historical contexts. And 
position, bringing here and putting forward trans epistemic language education as exemplified in this presentation illustrates how we can foster epistemic learning and unlearning to address colonial lingualism, both in face to face and online environments. So in, in some or in essence, this presentation is a call to, first of all, identify colonial lingualism. And there are some reasons for that. To pinpoint its destructive epistemic foundations, to address the transformative limits of translanguaging and plurilingualism, and to suggest how we can unlearn inequitable teaching practices in English language education, and also to inspire an open future dialogue um, in and amongst educators, researchers, and learners um, themselves. So it is hoped that by recognizing the symptoms of colonial lingualism, we can prevent future harm and enable a respectful dialogue for more culturally and environmentally responsive practice in English language education, language education, and education more broadly. Tapalev, thank you in Gaelic. Miigwech, thank you in Anishinaabemwin for listening today. <laughs>